I've ever seen in my life. I'm as cool as someone's dad. And you know how uncool that is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to get too far behind uh, this podium, but I, I do want to keep my hand on the, on the little space bar here. Um, $275,000. I've got, I'm right here. $275,000. I used to tell Karen several years ago when you were a mere uh, $60,000 team that that was a pretty good relay. $150,000 is a pretty good community, but $275,000, that's, that's a pretty good area for a lot of groups that need, have five or six events. So for a team to be doing what you're doing, I've kind of followed along. I've never been able to be here for one of your celebration thank yous, but I, I certainly have been fully aware both divisionally and regionally and, and nationally at what Newcore and the Decatur Newcore team is doing. I want to tell you a little bit about my story and uh, my wife is sitting back there. She is already mad at me. I asked her to help me pick a few pictures. She didn't. She chose not to and while I was here a while ago she actually caught a glimpse of some of the photos I had pulled. She is now not speaking to me. So. <laughs> But uh, she actually heard me tell her story 15 years ago, and this is the first time she's been back, because now her story has also got a new chapter. It's also my story. This is a story of a his and her survivorship. And uh, I met my wife at a first grade birthday party. You have to understand, we were not chaperones. We were participants. We were invitees. We were rowdy six-year-old party goers. This was in the little town of Tryon, North Carolina in 1961. I am a little over 50 now. Cindy Bishop always had the best birthday parties. She had balloons. She had clowns. She had pony rides. It, it was remarkable. Now this particular Cindy Bishop birthday party in 1961 was held at Harmon Field, which was our local recreation center. I was in the midst of a game called Wicked Stick. Wicked Stick was kind of a, a, a hide-and-go-seek sort of game in which if you got to the stick before the guy who was it could get it and capture you, you could grab the stick, fling it off into the horizon, free everybody he had already captured, and put him back at square one. Well, I had successfully done just that. And as I sprinted around the equipment building at this recreation center, to find a new place to hide, I, I was feeling pretty good about myself. And that's when this all started. In full stride, I glanced to my right toward the Redwood Picnic Shelter, right there at the rec center, and I literally stopped dead in my tracks. For at that moment, I totally forgot about Wicked Stick. There seated in the window by herself, someone caught my eye. She was in a little white dress with blue frills. And to this day, honestly, I am not kidding. To this day, I remember thinking, who is that? Oh, God, here goes the R. <laughs> now, I know it sounds like a smarmy, soapy, syrupy scene from a bad after-school special on the Disney Channel. <laughs> but you have to understand, I thought I knew everyone at Cindy Bishop's birthday parties. So we were a little town far smaller than... Than Decatur. We live in Pulaski, right across the state line of Tennessee, far smaller than Pulaski, more like Ardmore, for those of you who, who know the, uh, the twin, twin state town of Ardmore. So our little try in North Carolina was a tiny town, and I thought I knew everybody. Uh, I did not know who this little girl was sitting in the window in this white party dress. Now, before all the oohs and the ahs of this cute little Robin Foster picture, makes you all sound like a bunch of oogling, drooling grandparents. Just know that the boy was no slouch himself. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's how the story began. Robin and I would eventually be in the same classroom, finally, I think, in the fourth grade, and got to know each other some in junior high. She really didn't like me too much. Now, she will tell you that she thought I was way too full of myself. Imagine that. Could you even see most of you haven't even met me and you already can figure out she pretty much had me nailed on that. I claim to this day that she just at the time did not know me well enough to just see that I was indeed as wonderful as I thought I was. 
We finally got together during our freshman year in high school. And I told her parents about that Cindy Bishop first grade birthday party. This was an afternoon. I, first time I'd kind of been around them. I actually caddied for her dad at the golf course. Didn't know that connection until I walked in. And that was, oh, it's that Mr. Foster. Okay. So I told the story about the Cindy Bishop birthday party now eight years ago at that time. And I described the, the white party dress. Her mother got up and walked out of the room, and, and Robin rolled her eyes thinking that once again my self-proclaimed awesome personality had just again uh, in, offended someone else. But now, having been married to her for 34 and a half years, I do know that pack rattedness is an inherited trait between mother and daughter. <laughs> because in a few minutes, her mother walked back into the room with the party dress, as I had described. Actually, not that dress. It's a good... Like, I guess I do like this. I know. Well, she'll, she's going to, again, that's one of the things I'll hear about in the wedding. That wasn't even the dress. But that's exactly what happened. Her mother had the dress. I knew then and there that if indeed someday we should marry and sadly divorce, her parents would sue for custody of me. I had them eating out of my hand. We dated through high school. Take, this is the part that's got me in trouble. Uh, taking parts in usual events like homecoming. Aww. Junior, senior, prom. Aww. See, I told you they'd like this. Yeah, she's really mad at that. And we continued off through college, and this picture has actually has nothing to do with it. It's just that I wanted my friends from the Mid-South Division to know I really didn't have hair once in a You see, Sam Taylor, I told you. Eventually, we did get married in 1978. I'm happy to say that I've never had to test that custody theory with her parents. We are happily married now for 34 and a half years. We have two children, ages 30 and 27. We've been through several job changes, through eight different homes in five different towns. Among other personal challenges, through two, two separate cancer journeys. First hers, and now mine. Both diagnosed as colorectal cancer 17 years apart. A rare, against all odds, his and hers, experience through which we have learned valuable lessons about life, about faith, about family and friends, and about each other. Now hers occurred on March 4th, 1995. It's a date that we know well because that was our son's 13th birthday. So when you hear parents complaining about the trials and tribulations of going through a child's young adolescent years, she trumps everybody by saying, well, tell me, how many in the room actually got cancer because their child became a teenager? <laughs> to this day, our son, who has a wonderfully wicked sense of humor, has never really found that to be a very funny joke. Aww. In all seriousness, Robin's battle was won against all odds. To be diagnosed with colon cancer as a female a month shy of your 40th birthday in and of itself is shockingly amazing. But the diagnosis came because her colon perforated as a result of the tumor. And had we not already been in an emergency room exam area at the moment it happened, we're just glad we, we're just glad we were. It's a start, it was the start of a two-year battle that would include 18 months of chemotherapy, six weeks of radiation, three surgeries, two blood transfusions. Yet through it all, we learned valuable lessons and wonderful truths. One of them came from my own father, small town family physician, who for some inexplicable reason felt compelled to call me one night. It was a, the following uh, her 11th month of treatment. It just so happened that only hours earlier, I had been informed by her doctor that another tumor had been discovered and she would be undergoing a radical surgery in only a matter of days. Somehow, I was supposed to break this news to a spouse who thought she was one of only one monthly treatment away from being done with cancer once and for all, and actually the next morning was to leave with her co-workers on a girl's weekend at the beach to celebrate the fact that she was almost done with her cancer treatments. Against the surgeon's advice, I pressed him for her odds. He told me, just don't don't worry about it. Don't, don't, we don't need to talk about it. And I just was adamant. Finally, he said the five-year survival rate for people who have to have this, under, uh, this radical surgery is about 28%. It's 
So I told my dad, I just sort of cried over the phone. I said, that's not, that's not even three successes in ten. That's not even a good batting average in baseball. And what followed would change my outlook and the outlook of a lot of cancer patients with whom I've shared this over the years. Let's talk in terms that we can both understand, my dad said. Let's talk sports. That and music are, are kind of two, or our two common topics. He told me over the phone, a survival rate is a game strategy for your doctor. It's like a coach looking at game films. He's looking at the other teams that have played a successful game against the opponent that Robin is about to face. He's going to look at all the successes, however often or infrequent they were, and he's going to ask, what offense did that team use? What defense did those teams use? Anything. What color were their uniforms? How many cheerleaders did they have? Any data that he can get because it was a successful battle against this common opponent is helpful. But my dad told me that's why survival rates are important to doctors. Now in this case he said a hundred games the teams have defeated this opponent 28 times. And doctors can use that information and maybe get a winning <coughs> strategy for Robin. But he said, what, what do those 28 wins have to do with her? She hasn't played her game yet. He says, as a matter of fact, a 99% survival rate isn't too darn comforting to the one team that lost. So he said, that information means absolutely nothing to Robin, to you, your kids, to any of us. He says uh, she doesn't have 100 chances to play 28 wins. She has one game to play. So he said that's why your surgeon was reluctant to even share that with you. As a doctor, he said, survival rates mean something to me, but I'm not a doctor for this battle. He said, I am a father-in-law. I'm your dad. We're just going to win one out of one. My dad died in 2001, and he left me with a lot of valuable insights, such as laughter is the best medicine, cortisone is a very close second. <laughs> when all else fails, sing, and if that doesn't work, sing louder. But that phone call, that unsolicited phone call on that night, might have been the greatest gift he ever gave me because it changed totally how I would look at challenges in life then and there, beginning with what Robin was facing. Now one of the other great insights came from the sweetest man on this planet, a gentleman by the name of German de Sasa. German is a native of Ethiopia, and he became my close friend when he came, we both were working at Presbyterian College when we lived in South Carolina. He was at my side during Robin's absolute worst moments. And I will never forget the day he stuck his head in my office to give me an insight that I share with people all over the United States. Now, now, my wife says I don't do accents very well, but even she'll say I do a pretty good German accent, not as in Germany, but as in German de Sassen. So he sticks his head in the office and he goes, and you have to picture this voice from this lovely man here, and he goes, Come, my friend, we must walk. Now, when German says walk, that means he's going to preach a little bit to you. And we start walking across campus, and he says, I want to share with you an old Ethiopian proverb. The taller the mountain that you must scale, the more you look at your feet as you walk. I, I immediately stopped, and I kind of gave him a look, and I said, that's so counterintuitive to me, German. I mean, in our culture, we're supposed to keep our eye on the finish line, the eye on the prize. He goes, oh, no, no, no. Is it not exactly how he talks? Oh, no, 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 no. Not when the obstacle seems so insurmountable, he says. It's overwhelming. So you look down at your feet, and you take a step, and you celebrate that step as a victory. And then you keep looking down, and you step again, and you celebrate the next step as a victory. You step, and you celebrate, and you step, and you celebrate, and you never look up. And then he's pausing put his arm on my shoulder and he said, and guess what, my friend? As you look down and you take each step and celebrate it as a victory, 
eventually you see the other side of the mountain. I still get goosebumps when I tell that story. But he was right. We learn to take each day as it comes. That was not easy. You have a test on Friday that you won't get the results till Wednesday, and every domino that fell was falling the wrong way. And it would be easy to sit there and just whine and worry and, and fret on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday because you just knew this would be more bad news on Tuesday. But we learned, first off, the monsters you make in your own mind usually are far worse than what reality is because we're not experts at this. We're not the med medical people. And the other part of the matter is, gosh, time is precious. And should that, should the uh, results on Tuesday not be as bad as you thought, you really wasted a good Saturday, a good Sunday, and a good Monday. And by the way, the results were already there on Friday. We just didn't know what the score of the final, of the, of the final tally was. So worrying wasn't going to change anything. And oh, by the way, if indeed, in this case, those results aren't very encouraging on Tuesday, it's tragic that you lost those when Saturday, Sunday, and Monday because you needed precious time that you can't get back. So we learned not to worry about things over which we had no control. When her long battle finally ended, Robin had become, in the words of, I can now say, our oncologist, his and hers, a living miracle. Now, this oncologist didn't administer her treatments. We were living in South Carolina at the time. This oncologist is in Nashville, but she has inherited her over the last 11 years and said, told me, you, of, of course you're going to be optimistic you're living with a miracle. I proceeded to become very involved in the American Cancer Society. 15 years through Relay for Life, celebrating, remembering, and fighting back. All seemed to be on the up and up, full steam ahead. Let's end this disease. So you can imagine our surprise when the results of my own colonoscopy on June 1st of this year indicated I too would now be facing a battle with colorectal cancer. I remember we got in the car for the drive home that morning and Robin was behind the wheel before she turned on the ignition. She said, wow, I, I didn't see that coming. You, th you think it's something we've done? Is it something in our house, something we've eaten? You know, and I said, you know, I know you think I'm kind of slow on the uptake sometimes, but you're not 17 years faster than I am. Uh, I, I think if we ate the same thing and you, it, it kicked you in the rear end 17 years ago, I would have been somewhere closer than 2012. And oh, by the way, we don't even live in the same state, let alone in the same house. And with that, I heard my dad's voice. Laughter is the best medicine. And I knew that I was up for this fight. So here we are, back as a team, battling colorectal cancer for the second time. And in doing so, I honestly have said I feel like the luckiest person in the world. I've got all this amazing experience that we gathered and the wisdom that came from the trials and tribulations of her battle. I've got 15 years with the American Cancer Society as a volunteer hearing unbelievable advances, hearing remarkable success stories from people whose, whose situations are far more dire and, and drastic than I, mine. And I've got amazing friends, many of them relay warriors like you, many of them in this room, cheering me on. A week after my diagnosis, I was at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville undergoing an ultrasound, and I like to tell everybody that it was a boy. And uh, the good news is it's not twins. Uh, <laughs> Actually, there was good news. The good news was that the tumor had not moved into the lymph nodes. That was huge. So about an hour after we were done, we are in a little Italian restaurant right up the street, Maggioni's. These folks in the back room know Maggioni's. Sort of a relay spot for our Mid-South group, but she'd never been there. It was only a, a mile from St. Thomas. It was rush hour at 5 o'clock, and I hadn't eaten in 24 hours. I said, I think I can make it a mile, but we're going to eat at Maggioni's. And as we raised our glass to celebrate that good news about the lymph nodes, 
I said, here's a toast. Even though I haven't talked to him in six or seven years, here's to German de Sasa. Because we just kept our head down and we're celebrating our first step of victory. By the way, that was a Friday. Hadn't talked to him in seven years. Guess who called me on my phone Monday morning because he heard a church in South Carolina about my diagnosis. Now you tell me there isn't a greater hand at work guiding this, this trip. You can't tell me that. So we've come full circle. These two six-year-olds from Cindy Bishop's birthday party in 1961 are still fighting for each other 51 years later. But now we know that our story didn't actually begin at Cindy's party. It actually started three years earlier. Now, stay with me on this math here. You see, the American Cancer Society has funded 46 Nobel Prize winning researchers for medicine. And one of those was honored in 1958 when he developed a chemotherapy protocol called fluorouracil 5-FU. It quickly became the protocol of choice for colorectal cancer, among others. It remains the protocol of choice for colorectal cancer. So as it turns out, these two six-year-olds, the American Cancer Society had already saved that little girl's life three years earlier, and she wouldn't need it for 34 more years. And on June 1st of this year, we found out at that same time in 1958, they saved the life of that little six-year-old boy. And he would need it for 51 more years after they did. Now my wife and I owe our saving grace to all the little blue-haired ladies, your, our grandmothers and great-grandmothers who went door-to-door -door in the 40s and 50s with those little canisters asking for it any dollars and dimes for the American Cancer Society. Then, beginning in 1985, Relay for Life, oh my gosh, and the world as we know it in the fight against cancer changed drastically. And then, in the early, mid-2000s, Nucor Steel in the Mid-South, oh my gosh. <laughs> now, who knows? Somewhere out there may be two other little six-year-olds. There may be a little six-year-old boy who is about to stop dead in his tracks at a first-grade birthday party upon seeing a cute little six-year-old girl. And you folks, with $275,000 as a team in 2012 alone, have already saved their lives. But for next year, the National focus, as you will learn about as you prepare for 2013, is to dream big, hope big, relay big, why not? So here's my challenge to you, and it is pretty audacious for me to challenge a $275,000 relay team, but by golly, that personality that she thought was so uh, full of himself still is, so I will do this. Here's my challenge to you. If you will dream even bigger, hope even bigger, relay even bigger, those two six-year-olds that you've already saved their lives, they may grow up not even knowing that cancer ever was once a disease. Why not? <laughs>